Ingrid Persaud, welcome to the Great Big Book Club. Uh, where are you? Are you in Trinidad? No, I'm not. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm in Wandsworth, Colwyn. Oh, <laughs> so slightly less glamorous. <laughs> much less glamorous and um, a lot greyer. Yes, yeah, a lot greyer. Yes, I imagine the colour's been turned off for you. Do you know what I mean? None of that's beautiful sunshine or anything. Um, yeah. Congratulations on your fantastic novel, uh, Love After Love, um, it, which is uh, published by Faber. Um, I would love you to give us a little snippet of what it's like. So if you could do a, read some, some of it for us just so we can see, taste, have a taster of what it's like. Sure. So um, the novel is set in Trinidad. It follows the lives of three people, um, Betty, a young widow, her son Solo, and their lodger, Mr. Chaitin. And um, everything goes well until a terrible secret is revealed and their lives are upended. And the story is really about how they um, deal with that and uh, find themselves um, together as a family again and uh, and how they learn about themselves. So I'm going to read um, two sections of the book, two little extracts. The first extract is um, from the first chapter of the book and it deals with um, an interaction between um, Betty and her husband uh, Sunil. And the second extract I'm going to read is uh, from the day Mr. Chaitan moves in with the family. In two twos, I dished out the stew chicken, vegetable rice, and green salad. Sunil used the fork like it was a, a shovel. When he's like this, anything can become an argument, and any argument can become a fight. Like salt cheap. But I hardly put salt in the food. He rocked back in his chair if looks could kill. You telling me you cooked this chicken and didn't put one set of salt in the pot? Silence. So what I tasting? Something must be wrong with my mouth. How I tasting salt soup? You know my pressure high and you giving me salt? Like you want to kill me, eh? I was careless. I'd left the rolling pin on the drain board, easy reach of Sunil's chair. That rolling pin might have hit the wall or the bed or the chair, but it found me. Doctor said the ulna and the radius snapped in two. My arm was in a cast when we buried Sunil a week later. At the funeral, I told people it was no big deal. I must stop being so careless with ladders. But I talk half and left half. People used to look at me and Sunil and say, Betty Gill, you're real lucky. In my head, I wanted to ask if they were making joke. Lucky? That man only gave love you could feel. He cuff you down, honeymoon. He give you a black eye, true love in your tail. He break your hand, a love letter. He put you in hospital for a week, love will stay the course. He take a knife and stab your leg, until death do us part. The second reading is um, told in Mr. Chaitan's voice, and it's the day he moves in, and he's interacting with a young solo. Miss Betty declared she was leaving the gentleman to sort out everything and going to take her five minutes. Solo put himself in charge of settling me into the house. I was trying to unpack, but the boy kept calling me. Could he show me his room? Two minutes later, he wanted to, to explain how to use the TV. I had barely packed a drawer when he demanded I inspect the kitchen. What to do? He was only being friendly. Solo showed me everything, down to turning on the water heater if there wasn't enough hot water in the pipe. He was a completely different child from the morning they had stopped to give me a drop. A right little chatterbox. Mr. Chaitan, is that the last box you're bringing up? Yes, you stay. There's nothing else to bring. Ouch, oh geez and peas, that hurt. I had stumped my so-and-so toe on the sharp edge of the concrete step. 
books tumbled out the box I was carrying. A torchlight went clanking down the steps. Solo rushed to help. You all right, Mr. Chaitan, you all right? My toe, damn. That nail going to turn blue. I hit it and then the torch dropped on top of it. The boy ran after the torch and scooped up the books. You want ice to put on your toe? Don't worry, I'll manage. These steps are very dangerous. My daddy fell down these same steps and died right here. For true, right here. I don't remember anything because I was small, but I know he fell down. I'm sorry. Sometimes he used to drink, get drunk, and fall down. You mustn't say that about your father. But mommy told me that's what happened. I hoped Miss Betty wasn't listening. Her window was open, so unless she was sleeping hard, she must have heard children these days. I'm sure your father was a good man. Just please be very, very, very careful on the steps, okay? Especially if you come home drunk. You're not going to see me drunk. I take my carb or a stag now and then, but I'm not a drinker. And Solo, you must be careful on the step too. If I knew about your daddy's accident, I wouldn't have let you run up and down with boxes. I'm accustomed to the steps. Nothing will happen to me. He bent down and picked up a large plastic bag. A boy in my class said he does teeth curry bear from the fridge and drink it in the backyard. I hope you never do that. Mummy said that's the one thing she will give me licks for. I could do anything but that. It took the both of us till evening to put everything in place. Of course, I could have done it all much faster, but Solo refused to leave my side. I didn't mind, and although the boy's blabbering nonstop, half the time he's muttering to himself. At dinner, Miss Betty acted like she hadn't heard what Solo said about his father. Still, it bothered me. People like to run them out, especially when it's nothing to do with them. No, I wouldn't want that for these two. About half past eight, I asked Solo, please, let's knock off for the day. What wasn't put away could wait. Solo, you can help me again tomorrow, but not too early. It's Sunday tomorrow. Okay, I won't come in your room and wake you up then. Before you go, come let me whisper something in your ear. He smiled and came close. You mustn't go around telling people that your father used to drink. It doesn't sound nice, especially since he's passed. And it will make your mom cry. He leaned into my ear and whispered back, my mommy wouldn't cry for that. Thanks. Oh, fabulous. Thank you. It's really beautiful uh, hearing you read it. It's, it brings the whole thing alive so fantastically. Thank you very much. Um, so this Life After Love is basically a, sort of about a very curious sort of uh, nuclear family that are created out of, uh, out of um, uh, you know, the father dying and the lodger moving in and they create this sort of lo lovely family together, don't they? Until they is, there is the, the secret, which obviously we should not reveal. Mm -hmm. um, did you find it difficult to do because you had three different narrators and uh, and and different uh, you know you you've got the the colloquial Trinidadian voice in there as well it must be it's quite a lot to manage it's quite a lot to manage but um, interestingly it was easier to manage the the men's voices than it was the the woman's voice um, I found uh, it easier to project into um, the space of a, a teenage boy and a, um, a gay man than it was a middle-aged woman much closer to home. What does that say about you, Ingrid? I have no <laughs> idea, but I think it's something to do with, you know, the fact that women are excluded from so many um, spaces and um, roles that we grow up projecting and... Um, you know, it, it comes second nature to us, I think. Although, you know, other women writers say, you know, they, they can't do male characters. They, they, they do female characters much better. So 
it's just uh, just the way it's, it's kind of worked out for me. And you uh, you tackle some fairly big issues in the book, you know, sort of uh, self harming, domestic violence, and sexuality. Uh, were you were you was that, was that your aim? Was that the or did you have the story first and then? I mean, which way around did that go? So I definitely don't um, write with any. Um, big agenda or ideas that I feel must be co conveyed. I think I write the story that, um, that the characters compel. Um, and along the way, it's impossible to have a gay character in the Caribbean and not touch on the politics. Um, and Solo was a very troubled young man and I felt that, um, he would he would self soothe in in some particular way, and it have to be a hidden way, and so that led to the cutting. Right. So I didn't really set out for these things; it sort of happened organically. Uh, you you had a sort of an odd journey to to becoming a writer. I mean, you were uh, um, you studied law, and you were an academic lawyer. Is that right? Yeah. And then. And then you had a fine arts degree at Goldsmiths. Um, so were you, were you always percolating stories? Were you always thinking about stories or, or were you just suddenly struck one day by the muse? Um, I, you know, I came to, to writing via the scenic route, that's for sure. And um, I don't think it occurred to me that it was possible to be a writer until much later in my life. You know, I, I come from a a very simple family um, of, uh, you know, in the Caribbean, if you're from a middle class Indian family, you're expected to be one of three things, a lawyer, a doctor, or a failure. And I chose to be a lawyer. Um, and then in, in my 30s, I went back to school, um, really kind of looking for some way of, of harnessing my creativity that I felt wasn't being used and so I did fine art and I was using a lot of text so I guess text has been running through my my career but um that I should end up a writer finally is is you know a great delight and a joy well you're clearly brilliant because you won the BBC short story award I mean what did you what how did you what possessed you to enter that? Was it just like, uh, I'm going to really go for this or, I mean. So um, the story had be, had won um, the Commonwealth Short Story Prize um, before and- Why did um, you enter that as well? I mean. Ah, uh, okay. So that was um, to give myself some discipline. So I, I thought that um, I could write a short story if I had like a deadline and an objective. So. That's why I entered that. And I didn't think it would go as far as it did. And um, the BBC Short Story Prize, that was a bit of a whim. Um, so no, these, are, these weren't um, strategic decisions that paid off. This is um, a bit of serendipity, I think. Clearly. And so did you, did you when are you, was like was love after love commissioned or did you have to have a were you did you sell it on a sample could you tell me a bit of the story behind that so um after the bbc short story prize when i um i acquired a fantastic agent zoe waldy from rcw and um i showed her twenty thousand words of love after love and she said this is fantastic um you know, when can I see the rest? And I said, this is in October. Um, and I said, oh, you can have it by the end of the year. And I went home and just sat down and didn't get up except to eat or go to the bathroom or occasionally sleep. And I wrote the rest of the book. And so um, I didn't know at that time that when writers say you'll get a book, you know, <laughs> this, the end of the year, you have to usually specify which year. I was still, you know, working in, in, in another mode. <laughs> so 
so I, I felt I had to give her the book. So I gave her the book at the 31st of December, you know, at 4 p.m. I'd, I'd hit my deadline. And um, we, we were able to sell that book um, to Faber. I'm very lucky. And uh, here we are. Brilliant. And is, is, there, a, is there another, another one on, on its way? Gosh, you're not letting up, are you? Um, so I, I, I've started work um, and uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Well, all I can say is, Ingrid, you've had incredible reviews. Um, then here's one here. It goes, restless, heartbreaking and intensely spellbinding. Uh, love after love will stay with you long after the last page. So huge congratulations on your book and uh, may it fly. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Nisha Dolan, hello. Welcome. Hello. Welcome. And congratulations on exciting times. Uh, <laughs> you, must be by, uh, you must be completely overwhelmed by how fantastically well it's doing. Overwhelmed is definitely the word. I process things um, very slowly and incompetently, so it's a lot of information just coming in at me, and I'm sure I'll have a coherent reaction to it in a year or so. They're really exci well, exciting times indeed. Um, so uh, it's published by Biden, Felt and Nicholson um, as part of Orion. So could you possibly give us a little taster so we can uh, hear you read it, please, and then we'll have a chat about it afterwards. Yeah, so. I thought I'd just start at the start, probably the easiest. July 2016. My banker friend Julian first took me for lunch in July, the month I arrived in Hong Kong. I had forgotten which exit of the station we were meeting at, but he called me saying he saw me outside Kiwa Bakery and to wait there. It was humid. Briefcase bearers clocked out of turnstiles like breeding genets. The tannoy blared out first Cantonese, then Mandarin, and finally a British woman saying, please mind the gap. Through the concourse and up the escalators, we talked about how crowded Hong Kong was. Julian said London was calmer, and I said Dublin was too. At the restaurant, he put his phone face down on the table, so I did the same, as if for me this too, this represented a professional sacrifice. Mindful he'd be paying, I asked if he'd like water, but while I was asking, he took the jug and poured. Work's busy, he said. I barely know what the hell I'm doing. Bankers often said that. The less knowledge they professed, the more they knew and the higher their salary. I asked where he lived before Hong Kong and he said he'd read history at Oxford. People who'd gone to Oxford would tell you so even when it wasn't the question. Then, like everyone, he'd gone to the city. Which city, I said. Julian assessed whether women made jokes, decided we did, and laughed. I said I didn't know where I'd end up. He asked how old I was. I said I'd just turned 22, and he told me I was a baby and I'd figure it out. We ate our salads, and he asked if I'd dated in Hong Kong yet. I said not really, feeling yet did contradictory things as an adverb, and there were more judicious choices he could have made. In Ireland, I said, you didn't date. You hooked up, and after a while you came to an understanding. Julian said, so you're saying it's like London? I don't know, I said. I've never been. You've never been to London? No. Ever? Never, I said, pausing long enough to satisfy him that I'd tried to change this fact about my personal history upon his second query and was very sorry I'd failed. Ava, he said, that's incredible. Why? It's such a short flight from Dublin. I was disappointed in me too. He'd never been to Ireland, but it would have been redundant to tell him it was also a short flight that way. We discussed headlines. He'd read in the FT that the offshore in Mindy was down against the dollar. The one piece of news I could offer was that a tropical storm was coming. Yes, he said, Miranai and a typhoon the week after. We agreed it was an exciting time to be alive. Both storms came. Unrelatedly, we kept getting lunch. I'm glad we're friends, he'd say, and far be it from me to correct a Bailey old man. I felt spending time with him would make me smarter, but would at least prepare me to talk about currencies and indices with the serious people I would encounter in the course of adult life. We got on well. I enjoyed his money, and he enjoyed how easily impressed I was by it. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. That's, I mean, beautiful, beautiful, brilliant book. Um, it's, it's set in Hong Kong, obviously, which is where you went after, was it after you left Trinity? Yeah. Uh, and there was a brilliant line when, in an interview I read about you where it said, um, I went to Hong Kong mainly because mainly I thought I should do something. Yeah, I feel like when I'm asked about my reasons for doing things, because I'm a storyteller, aren't, like aren't we all? So I tend to come up with reasons and then justify them extensively. But honestly, I put very little thought into my personal decisions. And so I, I, like you can find loads of interviews where I give different contradictory reasons for why I did various things, because it's just what I felt on the spot. But no, it was a fairly impulsive but rewarding decision, I guess. It was clearly the creative spark that you needed to, uh, to, to get exciting times going. Could you tell us a bit about the, the three different characters in it, Ava, Julian and, and Edith? Yeah, so our narrator Ava is a young Irish woman who's cognitively very busy, but regarding her choices and how she exerts herself in the world, um, considerably more of a bystander. She comes to Hong Kong, finds herself thrown together in relationships with these two different people and much of the novel is her attempt to navigate different facets of her personality, this desire for on the one hand self-protective irony and detachment which then precludes her from also feeling the happy end of the emotional spectrum having um, completely blanked out on the depths of despair that one can have and then on the other hand the prospect of opening oneself up to that range of emotions and then the two different relationships bring out either end of that so the first one being with Julian who caters as a, a sort of wry curt individual to that side of her that fundamentally doesn't want to feel things and then Edith a uh, Hong Konger who's a more earnest not sentimental but joyous person it's almost like she's sort of dipping her toe into the emotional pool as to work work out whether she wants to dive straight in or uh, or stand on the on the side still so i mean that's her dichotomy isn't it between uh, between julian and edith yeah there's an internet meme that i saw after i wrote the book that i think sums it up very well um of weighing up between feeling loved and the mortifying ordeal of being known and I think that's basically the hell of novel. Are you willing to let people see you including in ways that make you feel vulnerable for the intimacy that that provides? And you clearly like playing around with language, I mean that that is very very evident in uh, in the novel. Did you, uh, did, uh, see, did you study English at uh, Trinity? Yeah, and before that I had quite an early interest in language that was sparked probably initially by studying Irish in school, also by encountering quite a bit of the Bible in school and wrapping my head around these old weird words, and then later French and Spanish, and just a, a variety of different levels of exposure to grammatical concepts and all the rest of it. Um, so I think that all fed into an interest in language, yeah. But you also, but you also studied um, uh, Victorian literature, did a master's at Oxford. I mean, what was that like? That must have been joyful and fantastic. I'm slightly envious of it. Yeah, um, I think, I, like, it was definitely great getting to study in depth all these books that we'd only really scratched the surface of before and going down some critical rabbit holes my favorite being um, a book I can't remember the title I think it's something like Dickens and the Interrupted Quotation dedicated entirely to Dickens's habit of interrupting um, quotations of his characters with a lot of narrative prose in between so like x said y comma long interlude from Dickens and, th and then continuing and it's a whole book around that so if you're the kind of person who likes to take a small thing and understand it very well it's a good place for that but it was also just a fascinating study of how different countries interact with literature especially because so much of the Irish study of literature is shaped around how England has navigated the Anglophone tradition but there were big differences at the same time like 
English people don't read a lot of plays. They really don't. <laughs> like, there were such huge gaps in any kind of dramatical knowledge for the 19th century, like, so that kind of thing. Yeah, so it was really interesting. And uh, and you came you came out very quickly out of the blocks in your in your in the term in, in sort of writing terms. Did you um, did you have the idea for exciting times? Did you what did you do? Did you just have a very did you sell it on a partial? Because I know there was a huge bidding war for it. What what actually happened? I wrote the book pretty much in isolation, and then I showed it to my agent, and then we did a few edits together and then she sent it out and we were really lucky in how people responded to it but most of the process was quite solitary yeah and uh um, did you did it was it a had it been in your mind while you were in hong kong had it been percolating for that period or uh did you write it while you were in hong kong i wrote the first chapter i was there yeah and it wasn't a hugely premeditated experience i think possibly that can through my writing style maybe it doesn't but I'm quite fragmented in how I go about it I just pursue whatever interests me or if nothing interests me at all then I just make something up until I have enough words I think you remember your headspace when you wrote things that you were really happy while writing and then you tend to think of it as I need inspiration but you actually don't at all like if I look properly at the book I can equally point to bits where it was really boring and hard to even get 10 words out but they read exactly the same to people reading the novel for better or worse. It's weird that isn't it you you you, you, you would think it would read less of like some awful constipation but in fact it reads exactly the same way as, as the rest of it. Um, and how are you coping with all the Sally Rooney comparisons? I think you just have to let people respond to a text on their own terms and I wouldn't want to tell anyone what those terms should be. But there have been other comparisons. I've heard a lot to a text of Mosh Feg and I think there's suddenly a shared modern sensibility but maybe my character is a bit more politically earnest and emotionally earnest to an extent. Um, and I wrote a column on my love of Sayaka Murata's novel Convenience Store Woman and off the back of that a lot of people said they hadn't thought of that parallel until I wrote that column, but then suddenly they were seeing Convenience to a Woman everywhere in my novel. And I think that's actually quite apt. I think we both have heroines who do a degree of analysis of the people around them that most people don't find necessary in order to navigate the world. But then having done that analysis, a lot of it is actually quite familiar to us. It's just um, maybe the need for it isn't there if that stuff comes more automatically to you. And are you, are you doing another one now or are you just sort of exhaling a bit, relaxing? Oh, no, 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 I don't relax. Um, so I have a second one written, but it's about two women who go mad and I don't feel like working on it. So at the moment I've shelved that and I'm on a third one, but I've no idea which of them will end up as the third book, as the second book rather. I might never feel like returning to the second one. We'll just see, I guess. Well, well, listen, honestly, I, the uh, Exciting Times is, it, it has had incredible reviews. I'm just going to read you this little one here. It goes, fiercely intelligent, brutally funny. I've written with such, such heart, Exciting Times announces an impressive new voice in literature. So, Nisha, congratulations. And uh, it's out now with, um, from Bidenfeld to Nicholson.